This program consists almost entirely of film never before seen in public. In the silent days, Hollywood incinerators worked round the clock. And this is one reason why Chaplin's working methods are so little known. Like all filmmakers, he destroyed the film he didn't need, his outtakes, his rushes. And film that escaped the flames often destroyed itself. It could rot through chemical decomposition film which might be as revealing as the sketchbooks of a great artist. For Chaplin was a great artist. As far as the art of film is concerned, many consider him the greatest. Another clown, Grock, said of him, Chaplin gave our generation true insight into the heart of a clown. More than that, into the heart of all browbeaten humanity. But Chaplin was very secretive about the way he worked. Only once did he allow himself to be filmed in action for a feature of 1923. And then only in brief shots like these, which gave nothing away. He was the silent filmmaker supreme. But he shrouded these early days in mystery to the end. Those films made under his control, he carefully preserved, his classics, which have given us all some of our most precious memories. For this film, Chaplin did not own the copyright. Easy Street, made for Mutual in 1916. These early comedies Chaplin ignored. 
Many passed into other hands, copied and recopied until they were a strain to watch. This is how the original prints once looked. The photographic quality is sharp and clear, emphasizing the tragedy that so much has been lost. But by a miracle, some Chaplin outtakes have survived. Can after can of them, from the period of the mutual two reelers. No one survives from the mutual period, so the film in these cans must tell its own remarkable story, a kind of archaeology of the cinema. New York, 1916. Chaplin receives a bonus check from the president of the Mutual Film Corporation. His first year's salary, $670,000 plus the bonus. In return for becoming the highest paid entertainer in history, Chaplin has to produce 12 smash hit comedies. The first is The Floor Walker. Its subject, with typical Chaplin irony, is embezzlement on a grand scale. He gathers his stock company of cast and technicians. They will work on all the mutuals. The heavy, Eric Campbell on the left. The heroine, Edna Purviance. Character man, Albert Austin. And Henry Bergman, who supported Chaplin in so many ways. Behind the camera, Rolly Totherow, who's been with Chaplin a year. Chaplin has come to depend on Totherow's camera eye as a kind of second director. Mutual builds Chaplin a studio in Los Angeles. They call it the Lone Star Studio. Like other studios of the time, it's open to the elements. Muslin cloth diffuses the sunlight, but fails to keep out the wind. This first comedy was inspired by the big department stores that Chaplin had seen in New York. He reproduced one in his studio, but he still needed something to set his film apart. In New York, he had seen a man tumble from an escalator. Without knowing precisely how he would use it, he ordered his construction crew to install an escalator in his set. I would build these sets without an idea in my head, Chaplin said. But once they were there, comic situations would develop. And one can watch them develop in his rushes. Rushes which have not been seen for nearly 70 years. The slate board provides a new number for every shot. Here at last is a key to unlock the secret of Chaplin's working methods. His rushes show brief but precious glimpses of Chaplin directing, of Chaplin improvising on the escalator, of the camera crew at work, of Chaplin relaxing between takes. The first revelation the rushes provide is that Chaplin rehearsed on film. Here he shoots a scene on his new prop which has only been roughly worked out. Having screened it, he reshoots it to quicken the action. In the film, the goods are going fast. The manager's going too. He's been embezzling along with the floor walker. In the ensuing mayhem, the escalator becomes the star of the film. As the great Max Sennett said, why the hell didn't we ever think of a running staircase? and sets with a springboard for all the Chaplin mutual comedies. <laughs> Chaplin was living at the Los Angeles Athletic Club when the idea of a comedy set in a health spa occurred to him. The film would become one of his most successful 
the cure, yet it proved an enormous struggle. He followed his usual method, working entirely without a script. He decided his health spa should be a prosperous place. Its focal point should be a drinking fountain with pure spa water. The man who found the well, played by Loyal Underwood, should be a physical wreck. So should his employees. Amidst all this tranquil suffering, what could Charlie do? His first appearance with Eric Campbell gives him plenty of scope for slapstick. But almost at once, he finds himself slowing up. He next aims directly for the first joke. And the action quickens. Chaplin is signaling two reels of unmotivated anarchy in his very first scene. And that is more Max Sennett's style than his. When he views this scene, he quickly spots its defects and knows at once he can do better. By setting it in the lobby, he can provide some reason for the gag. He can also change his costume so it shows up better. And with Eric Campbell as the victim, there's more reason for Charlie's callous behavior and its results. Now Chaplin changes the man in the wheelchair to Albert Austin. The raised skirt is more diverting on the stairs. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Chaplin is suffering from a creative block. He repeats the scene a dozen times without being able to improve it. But all the work with the wheelchair gives him a brainwave. Charlie on the side of authority, bringing order out of chaos, is inconsistent with his character. Chaplin brings on the manager to end the joke. He senses there's little future in the bellhop character. 77 slates in. The health spa is rebuilt. The drinking fountain becomes a medicinal well. Now there is a resident drunk. When Chaplin showed John Rand how to play the part, he must have recalled his own music hall career when he specialized in drunks. And he makes a dramatic decision, a decision to scrap everything and start again by simply reversing the roles. He has found the character and the costume. The only reminder of all he has discarded is the wheelchair. It is replaced by another mobile prop, the revolving door. The chaplain had a lot of trouble with inanimate objects. After a dozen takes, his cane accidentally jams in the door. But in the film, he uses the mishap. The revolving door sparks off one of the most hilarious moments in the picture. 
This is not Eric Campbell, but a stuntman. Chaplin has told him to stay underwater for as long as he can, waving his legs. The signal for his rescue, his legs together. Among those who rush to pull him out is Eric Campbell. The gymnasium is the heart of a health spa and the heart of this film. Chaplin had many attempts to find the right gags. This sequence was cut from the final film, perhaps because it lacked the logic Chaplin was always searching for. He uses the contortionist a more memorable effect in the massage scene. Six hundred and twenty-two slates in. Chaplin is reluctant to throw away the traffic cop gag, and he tries to fit it into the new shape. But without a uniform, there's no reason for the gag, no logic, and Chaplin discards it. This romantic interlude, with Charlie promising to take the pledge, demonstrates the perils of directing and acting in the same film. Had Chaplin been watching from the camera, he would have noticed the overhead diffusers waving in the wind and letting sunlight through to the steps behind. Surviving prints of the cure always fade out at this point. Uh, could this have been how the film once ended? Or is Chaplin just fooling for the benefit of Edna Purviance? Edna Pavance was Chaplin's leading lady for eight years. She'd had no acting experience, which Chaplin preferred. This camera test shows the features which first attracted him. She had a sensitive mouth, he wrote, and beautiful, large eyes. She was more than pretty. Here, Chaplin directs her in a scene from The Adventurer. He wants her to resist Eric Campbell's advances with cool distaste. Edna was not a born actress, as these outtakes show, and Chaplin invested enormous effort in wresting a performance from her. She seems fed up shooting take after take, but her fatigue is part of the performance Chaplin is squeezing out of her. Gradually, she gives him the quality he wants. But he adjusts her position and tries again. Edna was required to be cool and distant so often that one critic wrote, Edna Pavance may always have been sad. These rushes would have surprised that critic. Edna's sense of humor delighted Chaplin, but cost him a great deal of film. For not only did she break up on her own performance, in this scene from The Vagabond, she burst in on an actress playing her mother. In an outtake from behind the screen, Charlie coaches her as though he were a director and not just an assistant prop man. 
But much of their work together must have looked like this. Chaplin tries another version for his encounter with Edna. Desperate for work, she has disguised herself as a prop boy. She plays a harp, which Chaplin realizes is a trifle unlikely. A guitar is more masculine. But the boy's clothes merely heighten Edna's femininity. It's hardly surprising that for a while, she and Chaplin had as close a relationship off screen as on. Behind the screen was a parody of Life at the Max in its studio, where Chaplin began his film career. In the film, Charlie skillfully avoids all the pies, but not in the outtakes. Senate comedies were also famous for glamorous girls. Dancing girls, bathing beauties. Chaplin parodies them all with his Dance of the Cleaning Ladies. On the next door set, the drama director is behind schedule on his historical epic. The executioner has no idea how to handle his axe. The director gives him a lesson. within an inch of his heel, and there's no doubt the axe is sharp over the blade is buried in the floor. Risky to do once, Chaplin does it again and again. Watching it slowly shows how close the axe comes to his foot. How it was done was never revealed for Chaplin's favorite mystery. The solution can only be found from the film itself. If we slow this down, it's even more baffling. He seems to kick an object on the floor and his hat wobbles before he conjures it on his head.
Chaplin wanted the axe to fall dangerously close without danger. This slate board provides a clue as to how he did it. And the answer shows how skillfully Chaplin and his technicians could use camera tricks when they needed to. It was done by cranking the camera in reverse and staging the action backwards. The hat falls from his head, which is the reason for the wobble, and the object on the floor is a mistake. His pipe knocked from his mouth. And after all this effort, the scene was cut and never shown. A Chaplin mystery, a film that was never made. The setting, an artist's cafe. Edna Pavant is the girl, as usual. She could be playing a kind of trilby to Eric Campbell's Svengali. Albert Austin delivers a challenge to a duel. Whatever the idea, Chaplin rejects it. For now, he starts in earnest, on slate one. Albert Austin wears the same costume. Charlie is better dressed than usual. Chaplin puts Austin off his concentration. After all, it's only slate one. 46 slates later, and Chaplin uses a tracking shot to introduce Edna in the background on the left. Now Edna wears a different costume and plays a different character. A lonely girl who can't afford a meal. When Charlie enters, the artist cafe is still in evidence. Now his intentions become clearer. Here is how he planned Slate One to fit in. He cast Henry Bergman as a bullying waiter. The film is a simple cafe comedy about a man who has never been in a cafe. That's all it is, so far. Now he's got rid of his companion, Charlie discovers a new interest.
now sees the importance of table manners. A customer in trouble for not paying the bill. In his early years, Chaplin was intimidated by waiters, and he knew just how many people shared his response. Charlie checks his own money supply. Chaplin usually plays such scenes with delicate restraint, but in this outtake, his improvisation gets the better of him. Finding a coin on the floor gives Charlie the confidence to recall the waiter. Henry Bergman was a staunch member of Chaplin's stock company, proud of his ability to play any part. But Chaplin was now wondering about his ability to play this one. Bergman plays the scene without that extra sense of menace so vital to the role. Chaplin is halfway through the film. He has discovered at last that he has the right approach but the wrong actor. He has to make a drastic decision kind of decision that drives directors mad. The next day, he starts all over again. He has to reshoot all the waiter scenes with Eric Campbell, this time to much greater effect. The scene is so much stronger that Chaplin's reactions are stronger, too. By the change of actor, Chaplin converts a mildly amusing scene into what, in its full version, is a classic sequence of film comedy. Later, Henry Bergman is brought back to play a rich artist, anxious to paint Edna's portrait. Chaplin's original idea of an artist cafe pays off. The cafe scene cannot be sustained for a full two reels, even with retakes of Campbell. Chaplin needs another outstanding idea. He gets it by asking a simple question, where has Edna come from? Edna and her mother are immigrants. Chaplin now has the theme and the title for his comedy. He retains the emphasis on food. He does not, however, retain this scene. Chaplin plans to open the film with the boat scene, giving to all the scenes in the cafe an extra dimension. How the rocking effect was done is revealed in this photograph. 
A pendulum fitted to the camera enables it to swing as soon as the boat itself begins to rock. Chaplin makes even the misery of the immigrants seem comic. And he can use his stock company in new parts. Henry Bergman and Loyal Underwood. The set of the dining room is not on the boat, but in the studio. The cameraman accidentally reveals that the set is on rockers. It is here in the film that Charlie finally meets Edna. During the card game, Chaplin produces a prop he had never used before and would never use again. Other outtakes include flashes of Chaplin as director, telling Tiny Sanford how to move his arm, watching an uninspired actor in growing dismay. Becoming affected by Sanford's overacting. Sanford's whistling, or by his own method of shuffling in which he doesn't move a single card. In contrast to all this hilarity, a flash of anger at unruly extras in the farewell scene. Near the end of the filming, Chaplin ties up the loose ends. A coin now becomes the link between the boat and the cafe. After 745 slates, he has to reshoot his meeting with Edna, for now they know each other. now falls into place as Charlie realizes that Edna is alone in the world. What started out as a simple cafe comedy and now becomes a well thought out story of two immigrants who meet on a boat, part, and are brought together by fate, a coin, and a bullying waiter. The rich artist now propels them towards a happy ending. He will pay for the privilege of painting Edna's portrait. And Chaplin wraps up the story with this charming scene. In its release, Photoplay magazine said, in its roughness and apparent simplicity, the immigrant is a jewel. No fast seen in years has been more adroitly, more perfectly worked out. To make sure that everything was perfectly worked out, Chaplin surrounded himself with vaudevillians, like John Rand, who knew comedy inside out. And he had the help of one of the top English musical comedians, who can be glimpsed at the end of this take demonstrating the gag to Rand.
Charlie's older brother, Sidney Chaplin. Sidney, on the right, had been the more famous comic in England, but he took his work less seriously than his brother, which perhaps accounts for this piece of film, the kind of fun in front of the camera Charlie seldom indulged in. Sidney had just joined his brother as business manager, and he helped out on the films, for he was adept at every kind of stage work. Even a skilled a performer as Sid Chaplin could make mistakes. So it was with his brother. Buried among his rushes are his mishaps and accidents. The sheer physical strain of turning out a film a month was enormous, even though Chaplin was so young. Was it coincidence that in Chaplin's last film, under the demanding mutual contract, he plays a man who escapes from prison? The Adventurer was a film of speed and vitality, which began and ended with a chase. Later in the film, Charlie finds himself a guest at a house party, but he's never been a guest of anyone, except the federal authorities. Chaplin often started a scene with only the beginning worked out, hoping to be inspired en route. He usually was. Here he has the routine rehearsed as far as the drinks are concerned. to improvise. He doesn't get very far, but he's obviously pleased with the gag. This take is awkwardly staged. However, it gives him a bright idea. He should now meet someone. Who? He improvises a joke which convulses them both. Now everything falls into place. Charlie becomes better acquainted with Edna. This charming scene does not appear in the film. Chaplin has worked his way into a major difficulty. He had started a sequence with a Spanish dancer. We 
they've assembled the scene as we think Chaplin planned it. Having set up the Spanish dancer, Chaplin has to make something out of it. In this close-up, he conveys the effect on his pulse rate much more strongly. But he has given himself a problem by flirting with two women in one scene. Thirty slates later, he is still stubbornly trying to conjure comedy from an unpromising situation. Charlie thinks the dancer is causing him to overheat. Actually, he's sitting on a radiator leaking steam. That much Chaplin has worked out. What he hasn't worked out is what to do when he discovers the radiator. scene ends with a spontaneous but unrehearsed move, untypically clumsy, and much of it missed by the cameraman. Another 30 slates, and Chaplin is still in a corner of his own devising. But he has condensed the scene, and made the discovery more convincing. The steam is now painfully realistic. The scene leads neatly into the next. But each solution leads to another problem. Now he has to find a logical start to the radiator scene, which he shoots at the end. Now that he has worked out all the permutations after a hundred laborious slates, what does he do with the sequence? to it. No Spanish dancer, no radiator, just a hint of the dance. When I had difficulty solving a problem, wrote Chaplin, I would lay off work and try to think, striding up and down in torment. This unique fragment shows him in discussion with Albert Austin and Henry Bergman, his two closest advisers. It was the hours spent like this that produced moments like this. Chaplin made 12 outstanding comedies for Mutual in a mere 16 months. It was, he said later, the happiest period of his entire career. But he was not entirely happy with the films. Must every comedy end with a chase, he asked? In 
1917, he left. He joined First National, built his own studio, and at last achieved the independence he had aimed for. Now he planned to concentrate on quality rather than quantity. He would be the boss. He would produce great films. And those who worked with him describe how in the next episode. Well, making pictures those days was pretty much a home cooking proposition. In other words, if you needed a kid to play in the thing, you'd say, well, who's got a kid? And they'd bring one down, you know. And I lived up on Franklin Circle with my family, and they needed a, a kid to play a brat in this, in this picture, doing a lot of slapping and a lot of kicking and a lot of uh, torturing of poor Charlie. And uh, my old man brings me down, and I was a, a, a well-brought-up kid and a gentle child, and I, had no, I, I was not a great slapper of people. And so when it came time to start slapping people, uh, I didn't want to do it. I said, I don't want to slap. I don't want to hit Uncle Charlie. You know, I was a gentle kid. And poor Charlie uh, couldn't get me to slap him until finally he and Sidney were playing slapping games. And they say, Sidney, hit me again. And Sidney would give him a shot. And Charlie said, oh, it's so much fun. And oh, I just love it. And when he's hitting himself. And they finally convinced me that, that, that slapping was a great charge to him, you know. So I think I might have gotten into the swing of it later on. <laughs> Hollywood, 1918. Arriving at his own studio as the most successful film director in the business. And times when I was at the studio and he would arrive, Alf Reeves would shout, he's here! And I think that's the only time I ever heard that, in the theater among show people or um, on sets, film sets or anything. He's here. Like the prince has arrived. On this back lot, and on his two stages, Chaplin would produce his greatest work. He now had complete control over the making of his films. He even had his own laboratory. But he was still answerable to his distributors. First National had paid him a million for eight pictures, with no time limit. He'd taken two years to make four. With independence, he had slowed down. The hectic pace of the mutuals, 12 films in 16 months, had given way to an atmosphere of relaxation. with the company who would stay with Chaplin for years. These shots appear to be genuine glimpses of Chaplin at work. But no, they were staged for a film Chaplin tried to slip into his First National contract. First National rejected it. They were worried, for he was spending month after month on a mysterious film with a child actor named Jackie Coogan, the kid. Slate 1775, the only fragment of the rushes to survive. Chaplin was using more and more of First National's money and the film was growing longer and longer. He had a, a, an idea, and he just developed an idea from an idea from an idea. It was strictly a cuff tone, off the cuff. And the little, the little vignettes, they're all hung together by a, a small 
gossamer web. And uh, he was successful at weaving that. He was weaving gags together with dramatic scenes, pioneering a new type of comedy of feature length. But to First National, he was behaving like the character in his own film. Here we are into a big production. It's going to be six reels. It's already taken five, six months. And uh, no story. Just little bits of a story. And with only Chaplin there to solve what the key to the story is. Chaplin was given advice. Invite the first national exhibitors to the studio. They came in a body. I think they were going to lynch him. <laughs> and uh, they were, he knew what was going on. I mean, you know, Chaplin was no dummy. He knew that the pressure was on. And he uh, put me on <coughs> to uh, divert their wrath. And we got him wound up with a a whole bunch of stuff that, that I did with Chaplin. We had little bits that he had taught me and that, that uh, uh, I did a dance, I did the shimmy, stuff from the old act that these fellas had never seen before. time as you want, Charlie, and uh, he was going to anyway, because nobody could say hurry up to him. Chaplin's independence was safe. Chaplin introduces another child to the cast. Lita Gray. I became his flirting sweetheart in the heavens sequence of the picture. Because Charlie had been experimenting with me, putting my hair up on top of my head. My hair was long then. And he had the wardrobe lady dress me in my mother's clothes. And I photographed quite a bit older. So he said, I think we can use her as the, as the, uh, the, flo the angel. That was in the second half of the picture. The tramp falls asleep on the doorstep after he's looked for the boy. The child is taken away from him. And he uh, wakes up and thinks that the street is heaven and everybody has wings and it was very pretty. And I come around the corner sticking a very skinny leg out, I remember, in a flirtatious kind of way. back to school after I finished the kid contract. And I was bragging to Myrna about having worked for Charlie, what a marvelous man he was, and so forth and so on. And she was intrigued. She wanted to meet him. So I said, well, we'd go to the studio and watch him work one day, which we did. And as soon as Charlie came out to greet us, he said, you're just in time, because I've been testing brunettes for, for a part in the, in the Gold Rush, this film that I'm going to make. So he did another film test on me and decided that I would be right for the part. It was 1924. Lita was 15. Now Chaplin led his company on an expedition to Truckee in Northern California. It would be an epic, a story of the Klondike. 
Chaplin had never done anything like this before. He shipped up everything to make a huge production. For now, he was free of First National's petty restraints. He was one of the United Artists. He told Lita he wanted this to be his greatest film. Besides the animals, Chaplin brought virtually his entire crew, together with an Alaskan veteran. Sid Grauman, who owned the Grauman's, famous Grauman's Chinese theater here at that time, came down to the train to say goodbye to us, and Charlie held him on the train. He didn't have a toothbrush or a, or a change of clothes or anything, and he went all the way to Truckee with us and stayed the whole trip. Outside Truckee, there was nothing. The first task was to build the Gold Rush Village at the foot of Summit Mountain. Chaplin surrounds himself with associates, old and new. As an assistant, Eddie Sutherland, who recalls the trip in a 1959 recording. I was Chaplin's assistant, so I said camera and cut. And I made suggestions like everybody else, but don't let anybody tell you they ever directed Chaplin. Chaplin directed himself. Sutherland's first job was to organize the Chilkoot Pass. I had got a ski club from uh, Truckee. We went up and built the exact replica of uh, Chilkoot Pass. We sent down to Sacramento. We brought these 1,100 men from Sacramento, all tramps from the Yolo jungle. They arrived, we had them on the road at 6 o'clock. And we shot Chiu could pass all in one day, the entire thing of the guys going over the hill. And Charlie turned to me and said, Eddie, that's the greatest executive feat I've ever seen in my life. It is always thought that Chaplin returned from Truckee after shooting that one big scene. But a remarkable series of photographs from Chaplin's own archive tell a different story. They reveal that Chaplin shot all the exteriors on location, much to the regret of Lita Gray, who longed to get away from the wretched conditions. A lot of snow, very deep snow, and uh, we all had very heavy fur coats and two or three thicknesses of clothing, and it was cold. And uh, there again, many retakes. We thought we'd never get off that location. The crew carried cameras and reflectors high into the mountains to shoot scenes like this one. Charlie, lost, starving, finding a miner's grave. At this very spot occurred the tragedy of the Donner Party, pioneers driven to cannibalism. From this tragedy, Chaplin fashioned high comedy. We had built a chicken skin for a human being to get into, but we built it the size of Pete Stitch, who was the painter at the studio. And Pete got in it and just walked on, looked like a painter in a chicken skin, you see. So, well, he said, what do we do? I said, it's a very simple matter. You get in it, Charlie. He says, oh, I don't want to do that. I said, well, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to do it. He said, all right. So he reluctantly got into the chicken. And when he got into the chicken, he was a chicken. When Chaplin reissued the film in 1942, he spoke the narration himself, and he made a significant alteration to that final scene. And the little fellow gathered himself together, and James the valet was told to prepare for an extra guest. Pardon me, said the reporter, but who's the lady? Buzz, buzz, buzz. Oh, you don't say. Well, congratulations. 
Say, this will make a great story, and with a happy ending. And so it was, a happy ending. And he acted every little bit, and you always felt that there was a reluctance that he couldn't be behind the camera and in front of it at the same time. One way to overcome that problem was by his old method, rehearsing on film. Chaplin's rejection of sound seemed arrogant, but he knew the tramp could never speak. <laughs> 